All right. Now, the colonies, the original British colonies are divided up into three different spheres. New England, the middle colonies, and the southern colonies. The southern colonies basically just consisted of everything south of Virginia. The middle colonies were New York, Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So, pretty much right here. And the New England colonies were obviously just north of that. Uh, it's real easy to kind of remember them. Just remember N for north. And then you've got south and middle, the ones in the middle. Now, England had made some original attempts at trying to colonize the New World. Their first one was at Roanoke Island in 1587, and it went south really quick. They dropped settlers off. They went back to England to get more supplies. They came back. The settlers were gone. All that was left on a tree is this artist rendering depicts was the word Croatoan, which was the name of a local tribe. Uh, so the belief is they may have just killed them all, or they may have assimilated into the tribe. No one really knows for sure, but it kind of remains a mystery, and that's England's failed attempt at becoming a colony. The first permanent, keyword on, key in on permanent English settlement, the first permanent English settlement was established at Jamestown, Virginia, uh, which is not far from the Chesapeake Bay, not far from modern-day Washington, D.C., uh, and it included the very famous John Smith and his supposed affair, according to Disney, with Pocahontas. The colony itself was founded by the Virginia Company. Uh, the Virginia Company was a joint stock company, as it says right here, joint stock, uh, chartered by King James I in 1606, and it consisted of the Plymouth Company and the London Company. Um, this new colony, the new company, with the Virginia Company, they hoped to find territory, they hoped to find gold in, a new, in this area that was named after Sir Walter Raleigh, or named by Sir Walter Raleigh. Get rid of that after. By Sir Walter Raleigh. He called it Virginia because he named it after Queen Elizabeth, who was known as the Virgin Queen. She never got married, she never had any kids. It was assumed that she died a virgin. Now, the journey, the original journey to Jamestown, consisted of the three ships, the Susan Constant, the Discovery, and the Godspeed. 150 passengers and crew were aboard, and they landed in Virginia in 1606. They claimed the new land, named the settlement Jamestown after their king, who you saw in a picture before. In the early years, Jamestown, um, it was rough. It's not a place you'd want to live. Very contaminated water. It made people sick. Hunger flourished. Uh, the reason being, why? Because these colonists were not trained for a new life. They were not farmers. They were there for gold. Because they were there for gold, they didn't like to farm. A lot of these gentlemen thought they were too good for farming. And that wore on them. They didn't have any fresh crops. They didn't have anything to keep them alive. In 1607, only almost 38, uh, only 38 colonists were still alive. And that's when the famous John Smith took control. He forced labor, forced farming. Um, you would get flogged if you didn't. So this actually recreated Jamestown and allowed it to become more of a farming colony. He also increased relations with the Powhatan tribe, who we know is famous for Pocahontas. John Smith eventually was injured, though, when a powder horn exploded on his leg. He had to return to England and things would quickly deteriorate after that. Uh, in 1609, 600 new colonists arrived, but by that winter, Jamestown had deteriorated again to famine. This became known as starving time. Uh, among the dishes best served were rats, roots, snakes, bold shoe leather. Uh, during this time, about out of these 600 colonists, only 60 survived. You know, so it's pretty rough numbers there. Uh, and they, at this time, decided that that was enough. Enough was enough. They were moving on. They got on the boat and they left. But as they were leaving, more ships were coming down the river, and these new ships persuaded them to stay. This new, these new ships that came in brought, a, brought about a new way of life for Jamestown, a new way to prosper. It came under new leadership. This new leadership did not hesitate to flog or hang those that refused to work. So that idea of, of I'm a gentleman and I'm here for gold, that doesn't exist. Jamestown stabilized and it began to expand. Now, this is what you would see back then if you saw Jamestown on the top left. This is what the fort would look like. Uh, up here you would have cannons for defense. Uh, and then inside would be the settlements. Out here you'd have hunting grounds where they'd be mining for gold and so on and so forth. Uh, today, this is practically underwater. 
So if you still go see it today. However, you do have the very nice John Smith statue and the Pocahontas statue. Now, an important thing that Rolf, uh, John Rolfe brought with him was tobacco. Tobacco was a huge industry for the early settlement of Jamestown. It spurred Jamestown growth. It was highly profitable, which is why it became known as brown gold. So they didn't exactly find the gold that they were looking for, but they did find a very useful resource to turn into money. By the late 1620s, the colonies imported 1.5 million pounds each year. Now, tobacco is hard to grow. I don't know if any of you have ever spent time on a farm, but farming is hard work. The Virginia Company needed this workforce. First, it developed the Headright System in 1618, immigration sponsorship, which basically said, hey, if you come over, we'll give you 50 acres of land. So that's not a bad thing to think about if you're over in England you don't have any land. I can go to America and get 50 free acres of land. So the Headright System. Every head got you so many acres. Another way to get labor was through the indentured servitude method. Indentured servants were basically people that would come in and work the land for so many years in exchange for their freedom. Uh, in exchange for passage, food, shelter, an indentured servant would provide labor for a limited number of years, about four to seven years. Uh, this is a sponsorship. It's essentially people that didn't have enough money to make it to America. They would get somebody to sponsor them to come over. They would pay for their trip, and in return, that person that sponsored them will get four to seven years of labor. All right. And at the time, indentured servitude was actually cheaper than slavery. It was the ideal way to get labor for your farm. The first African, uh, African laborers are going to come over in 1619 aboard the Dutch merchant ship. Uh, Africans are actually going to make up a lot of indentured servants at this time. Uh, because, like I said, slavery was expensive. It's going to be several decades before the English colonies actually begin the systematic use of slave labor. Over the course of the years in the 1600s, there's going to be a transition from indentured servitude to slavery. Uh, and it's really just going to be a simple case of economic sense. In the early 1600s, an indentured servant cost you about a thousand pounds of tobacco, where a slave would cost you double or triple that. It's not very lucrative. By the late 1600s, the indentured servant population declined, which meant there just wasn't that many anymore. But the colony's overall wealth increased. That made slavery an ideal transition. People could buy slaves at a one-time price and keep them practically forever. Now, relations with Native Americans are also going to be kind of a strenuous affair in the early settlement. Uh, the English are going to basically treat the natives as a conquest. At the time, they were going on with their Irish conquests in the 15 and 1600s. They viewed the Native Americans similar to the wild Irish. They didn't want to live with them, amongst them, or to intermarry with them. That, of course, is a broad, uh, a broad conception. There are exceptions to the rule, but this was the norm. During starving time, English colonists actually sought trade with the Poetan Confederacy. Poetan is famous because that's the tribe that Pocahontas belonged to. Uh, leaders of the tribe are seeking to remove the English from Virginia. Uh, certain leaders are going to isolate the English colony, and they're actually going to set them against them pretty much forever and ruin the trade. In 1609, the Poetan Confederacy began to siege the settlement to starve them out. So this starving time was actually advanced or increased by the Poetan Indians trying to get rid of the English. Five years later, the English settlers were larger in size and started to begin pressuring the tribe to give them corn and labor. This was achieved through military force, and military force was achieved because the English had more advanced weapons, which just brings us to the uh, particular word of the day. So if you see this, if I, when I ask you, when I assess you on these notes, you're going to have to take notice that this was the word that you needed to give me. The reason they had superiority in military force is because they had guns, and that is your word, guns, all right? Guns, firepower, and this is going to be important later on when you look at the French and the fur trade, but guns is going to be an important and integral piece of that military force overwhelming the Indians. Soldiers would also set fire to villages, kidnap hostages. One of these is actually going to be Pocahontas, but it just kind of shows you the ravage of the countryside that's going to go on. It's not going to be a simple case of a dispute and a battle and it all ends. It's going to be annihilation. 
1622, you're going to have an Indian massacre. Uh, Chief Opekanakanahu led raids up and down the James River. This is going to kill more than 340 colonists. The results of this uh, Indian massacre in 1622 is the Virginia Company had to waste more funds, more time, more soldiers, more supplies. So King James is eventually going to revoke the Virginia Company's charter. What does that mean? It means Virginia is now a royal colony. It's under, under direct control of the king. England sends troops and settlers to strengthen and to conquer the Powhatan Indians. And it's all under the English domain and no longer under a company. In 1644, 10,000 Englishmen and women live in Virginia. Drastic increases in population. About 30 some odd years later, Bacon's Rebellion is going to occur. You have a growing divide between the colony's poor frontier settler class and the wealthy planter class. Now, this growing problem, former indentured service with little money to buy land, wanting to expand to get their own land, they weren't getting helped out. The government was not helping them remove Indians. Uh, they also didn't have any voting rights because they didn't own any land. They lived on the frontier. They were poor. They basically didn't have any rights, like this says up here. And it's because they have a lack of land. The poor frontiersmen felt oppressed by the colony's governor, Sir William Berkeley. Berkeley had been levying and imposing taxes, which was paid mostly by the settlers. Uh, the money is collected, and it's not used for public goods like roads or the army or any such thing as that, but for the profit of the planners, for those that are already rich. It's obvious that Berkeley is fairly corrupt. When hostilities arose with Native Americans, frontier settlers wanted these forts for protection. They felt they paid taxes. They should be able to have the forts. That's a public good. Taxes build forts. Berkeley wasn't having any of it. The settlers had finally had enough. They started to reach a boiling point. And they also became a part of another conflict with the Doeg tribe. Fighting broke out. The governor refuses to send troops or finance a war for poor settlers which is going to lead us to the Bacon's Rebellion. Nathaniel Bacon, a 29-year-old planter, mind you, not a poor settler, a planter. He was the son of a wealthy Englishman, and he also really hated Native Americans. In 1676, he's going to part from Governor Berkeley, who actually was his friend, and raise an army to fight Native Americans on the frontier. Governor Berkeley, who is he's going to label Bacon's army as illegal. Bacon, in turn, is going to march on Jamestown with his ragtag frontier army. Here he confronts lo colonial leaders about the grievances, including a lack of representation in the House of Burgesses, which we'll talk about in a minute. This rabble of frontiersmen resented being taxed and governed without consent. The march is going to turn violent. They're going to set fire to the town as Berkeley and others are going to flee Jamestown. The results? Well, Bacon is actually going to die a few months later, right around 1676. Berkeley returned and subdued the leaderless rebels. It pretty much everything just fell apart because Bacon was dead. But the impact is it drew to the attention of King Charles II, Berkeley's corrupt government. Charles recalls Berkeley to England, but he's going to die before meeting the king, so he never actually gets what's coming to him. It revealed the growing power of the colony's former indentured servants, though. These frontiers classmen, class could not be resisted. They could not be ignored anymore. Now, government in Virginia is a situation on itself. Uh, as soon as Jamestown was set up, they created a legislative body about 12 years after the first settlement. It's going to be known as the House of Burgesses. It's the first representative body in colonial America. Two citizens or burgesses from each district, and there were 11 districts in all, which meant 22 citizens set in a legislative body that dictated policy in colonial Virginia. Amongst these Burgess powers was the authority to raise taxes and make laws. Now, the royal governor could veto any act passed by the Burgesses, but raise taxes. Those taxes paid the governor's salary. So, though the governor may veto, the Burgesses can just pull his funding. Only white landowners at this time could participate and vote. 150 years later, the House would supply delegates to the Continental Congress, which just kind of shows you its lasting impact on American history. And here is the House of Burgesses today, and this structure is actually a reproduction that sits in Williamsburg, Virginia today.
at this point that we're going to end the notes on Jamestown. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email on the class webpage or to simply ask in class after we do the initial assessment. Don't forget the word of the day and be sure you check back from time to time and look over these notes. Go back over, make sure your notes are accurate, revisit the lecture, put it on your phone, study it, watch it, listen to it, learn it.